Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's presentation called Getting a Grant of Probate. I know lots of people are still filing into the, to the webinar, so we'll get it kind of a slow start here and we won't jump into anything juicy right away. Um, my name is Jessica Steingart. I am one of the staff lawyers here at the Center for Public Legal Education, Alberta, which is a mouthful, so we go by CPLE for short. And you'll see a, a little screen, a little box on your screen with the CPLE logo. And our education and evaluation specialist is, is back there, Natalie Tremblay. And she'll be monitoring the chat during today's session. So she'll be posting some really helpful links as we go. So make sure you, uh, you check those out as well. So quick note for today's presentation, um, we are providing legal information only, so we are not intending to give any legal advice during, uh, during today's session. I would also like to take a moment to acknowledge the very generous funding provided by the Alberta Law Foundation and the Department of Justice Canada, and without them, we would not be able to put on presentations like this one. A few other housekeeping items. Um, we will be posting a recording of today's webinar on our YouTube channel. Um, so watch for that in, in about a week. Uh, we'll also send you out a notice through Eventbrite when that's been posted. Um, so you can go back and watch it later on or refer it to others to watch as well. We are going to be going through several questions today, which some of you submitted early, which we very much appreciate. Um, but we will also leave some time at the end for some Q&A, kind of live Q&A. So we ask that you uh, use the Q&A box when you go to ask your questions. We won't be monitoring it necessarily during the presentation, but we will definitely get to it at the end. So you're welcome to pop the question in there if it comes up during the presentation, uh, but just know that we will save some time at the end to answer those. And one other housekeeping item, um, when you leave today's presentation, you will be prompted to complete a short survey for us. We'd really appreciate if you could take 30 seconds to do that. Uh, just let us know how we're doing and other topics that you might be interested in learning about. So who is CPLE? Well, we are a, a nonprofit agency serving all of Alberta. And our goal is quite simple, and that is to make the law understandable for Albertans. And we do this in a variety of ways, uh, largely through free legal ed education and information resources. So you may have seen some of our websites or videos or info sheets or FAQs or webinars like this one um, available to the public. And our goal is just to make sure that the law is available and understandable uh, so that Albertans are empowered to use it. And this is our website. So cplea.ca hosts all of our resources. So you can see kind of the range of topics that we cover. And like I said, everything is free. So you're welcome to go take a look around. And it's cplea.ca. Okay, without further ado, I said there was two other faces on your screen and I'd love to get, uh, love to introduce you to them and we'll get started with the rest of today's presentation. So I'm going to start with Benjamin Taylor. Hi, Ben. Um, ben graduated from the University of Alberta Faculty of Law in June 2012 and was admitted to the Alberta Bar in July 2013. He is the managing partner of Bar LLP and his practice focuses on property related areas of law. So that includes wills and estates, real estate and small business. Ben also teaches wills and estates at McEwen University. He's a former chair of the Northern Alberta Real Property Section of the Canadian Bar Association. And most importantly, he is the father of two young boys. Welcome, Ben. And the other face on your screen is Maya Claire Gordon. Hi, Maya. Uh, Maya is a partner at Reynolds, Mirth, Richards and Farmer LLP and has been working in the area of wills and estates for over 10 years now. She's a member of the executive of the Canadian Bar Association Wills, Estates, and Trust section, and she teaches wills and, wills and administration at the University of Alberta Faculty of Law. She is recognized as a best lawyer in Canada in the areas uh, of wills and estates, and also, most importantly, has a six-year-old and a two-year-old, and so she spends all of her spare time and energy chasing them around. <laughs> welcome, Maya, and welcome, Ben. 
So let's dive into today's presentation. We're going to do a bit of a Q and A um, between me and the panelists, and uh, we'll get to those questions that you submitted. So let's start with question number one, which is getting down to basics here. We're talking about getting grant to probate, but before we get into the getting part of it, let's talk about what is a grant of probate. So Ben, I'll start with you. Sure. Uh, so that, of course, is the most elemental question that everybody has, is what exactly is a grant of probate and what's it for? And what it is, is a court process to solve the fundamental question for estates, which is, if you walk into a bank and you have a piece of paper that says will on it, how do they know that that person has actually died? How do they know that the paper you're holding is, is for real? How do they know that it is the last will and testament and not an older will and testament uh, that favors you more? And so what the court does is it uh, answers all those questions by reviewing all the information about a person who's died, reviewing the last will they've produced, um, sharing that information with all of the interested parties, typically family and close relatives and people named in the will. And that creates a venue for everyone to air their issues or concerns and have their questions answered. And at the end of that process, they issue a court order that says two things. One, it, could, it says this is the last will and testament of the deceased person. And two, this is the person who's in charge. And they get to deal with the assets and distribute them. So we'll talk a lot more about what's actually in there. But at its most basic element, it is a court order that confirms that the will is legitimate and confirms who gets to act for the estate. Maya, did you want to add to that? I don't, I don't have anything to add. I think that was a great answer. By Perfect. Okay. So like we said, starting with the six. So now that we know what the what a grant of probate is, we can look a little bit more at this process. So our next question is, who can apply for a grant of probate? And Maya, I'll start with you. Yeah, so this is a great question. Um, I get asked this by clients a lot. Um, and when we talk, talk about applying for a grant of probate, kind of uh, included in that question, a grant of probate, as Ben mentioned, deals with wills. Um, and so when you see the term grant of probate, that implies that there's a will related to it. Um, a sort of secondary part of this question is who can apply for a grant of administration? And maybe we'll save that for another day. But I, just so that you know, if you see those two terms, a grant of administration is very similar to a grant of probate. As Ben mentioned, it's a court order that um, provides financial institutions and land titles with um, verification of who the right person to be speaking to is. Um, so that's called a grant of administration. But who can apply for a grant of probate? So the first uh, most important person to apply for a grant of probate would be the person named as the executor in the will. So if your family is wondering who's going to be the person who's supposed to apply, the first place to look is the will. Um, sometimes a will will have multiple people listed. So it would have person A, and then if not person A, then person B, and if not person A, person C. And it would be that order that's set out in the will that would give people the priority of who to apply. Uh, if the will uh, doesn't have uh, a, a, a executor named, which sometimes handwritten wills don't include that, or, or the will just happens not to have that information, um, it's called a, a grant of administration with will annexed. Not something probably everybody needs to know, but it's a, just a different variation on the grant. And in that case, it would be uh, usually a beneficiary who's named in the will who would have the ability to apply. I think one important thing to know, because I get asked this by clients a lot, is what if the executor who's named uh, in the will doesn't want to do it? Um, maybe you have person A listed and you've talked to person A and they say, I'm in another province or I have little kids or I don't want to do it. It's important to know that you don't have an obligation to act as an executor of an estate and you can do what's called renounce. So even if you're named in a will, you can still um, sign a form that the court has that would say, I am not applying and I'm going to pass it down to the next person name. So it's important to know that you do not have to uh, have to act as an executor. Um, a second thing just to know quickly is that um, 
if somebody is eligible to apply for a grant of probate, but they want to delegate it to somebody else, that's also available too. So you can either renounce and turn it over to the next person, or there's a process where you can nominate somebody else uh, who would uh, take up your priority. So that kind of gets a little more complicated, but I think the bottom line is the person who applies is usually the person named in the will. Um, and secondly, that you don't have to act if you're named in a will, you can renounce, which means that you would not be um, in a position of acting. And third, other people or other trust companies can apply on behalf of somebody who's named, um, and you would just have to speak to a lawyer about that process. And the only thing I would add is just to reinforce what Maya said, because uh, the renunciation she described, if someone doesn't want to do the job and they're named, is a very routine process. It's a one-page form. It's not extraordinary. It's something the court literally prompts you and asks, does this person want to renounce? So people should never feel that they're um, making a big ask when they renounce. It's a very ordinary thing to do. Excellent. Thank you both. Okay. So we're digging into all the who, what, when, where, why. So now that we know who can apply, Let's talk about the how. How do I get a grant of probate? Ben? So the we've talked about uh, who is in charge, who the executor is, and that's the person that prepares and files the paperwork. And the process is designed for laypersons, regular Joes, to do this themselves. It is challenging. It's a steep learning curve, but that is the way that's intended. All the forms are available on the surrogate court's website. It's not immediately obvious how you fill everything in, but it's relatively intuitive. Uh, the 30,000 foot description of those forms is they ask a lot of information about the deceased, uh, about the immediate family, and then they ask for information about the assets that are in the estate, as far as we can tell at that early juncture. And if, if it helps you to understand what these, form, what these forms are designed to do, is the will's kind of like a filter. And what you do is you take the assets of a deceased person and you push them into the will. And it will say things like, my car goes to my nephew, and then half of the residue goes to my kids. So you're pushing those assets through that filter of a will, and they shoot out to all the beneficiaries on the other side. And so what you're telling the court is, here's who's alive, here's who's passed away, here's what assets are in the estate, here's the will that we've identified, and here's how we think it gets distributed at the end. And um, that gets filed with the court. The court then wants to ensure that we serve every person who's interested. And again, that's typically the immediate family and typically the people mentioned in the will. And they all get to see this package. And that lets them come to the court if they think you've made a mistake or overlooked something, or they can deal with you directly. And when that process is done, the court just makes sure that we're following the rules in a, a strict compliance sense. And if the court is satisfied and no beneficiaries uh, have issues with what's submitted, a judge stamps it with their approval and the court order comes out. Uh, so it's really just filing paperwork and the information in it is relatively rudimentary and straightforward. You can do it yourself, but of course, for everyone, it's your first time. And for us, for Maya and I, we do this every day. So we've, we've seen a couple of states and um, it's much easier for us. Yeah, I don't really have a, 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 any additions to Ben's response. Um, and I'm going to discuss on the next slide about the, the different types of ways that you can apply in terms of timing. So maybe I'll save that for the for the next slide. Well, then I'll just slide right over to it. How long does it take to get a grant of probate? Tell them the good news, Maya. Oh, yes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Ben and I have both been doing this for over 10 years. Uh, when we both started... Um, we would, I would frequently tell people it takes about two months in Alberta. That was sort of my usual response at the beginning. Um, over time, uh, that got a little longer and longer. COVID obviously didn't help. The benefit in uh, Alberta, if you have an estate that's Albertan, um, is that uh, if as long as you have a will, and there are some um, other requirements, um, the list of requirements for using this system is evolving, but presently, if you have a will and the executors in Alberta, it's likely that you can access what's called a surrogate digital system. The surrogate digital system is a way of getting the grant of probate that Ben just discussed, but they've basically moved it into an online process. And if you use that and you meet all the criteria to use it, which, as I said, usually um, is met as long as um, 
as you have a will that's a, in existence and the executor is in Alberta, um, then you can use it. And typically I would say, and I, I don't know if Ben's had the same experience, most of my grants have come back in one to two weeks. Um, so it's a lot faster than what Ben and I used to experience when we started the two month period. Um, from the COVID 2020 to now, if you weren't using the SDS system, it was much longer. So it would be like in the three to five months. Um, so moving from three to five months, which is what we've sort of been dealing with in the last couple of years, um, to something as uh, quick as one or two weeks is a significant improvement. And, you know, kudos to the people at the courthouse who've been moving over the surrogate system to the digital format, because I think it's really streamlined and, and made it a lot faster. Just, just some things to know about the surrogate digital system. I see that uh, Jess has put some information in the chat. You're welcome to click that and learn a little bit more about it. Right now, it's restricted to use from law firms only. They're still ironing out some kinks and lawyers are sort of working with the justice system to make sure that anything that looks like a snag or isn't working properly is sort of being addressed. So it's celebrating its first anniversary, I think uh, this sort of late summer and fall. Um, but uh, but in the, that year, lawyers have worked with the justice uh, team to try to make it work as well as possible. So right now, um, people who do not use lawyers cannot access it. You would still be working on the paper forms. Um, that being said, if you hire a lawyer, you can access it. I think ultimately the intention of the courts is to roll it out so that public can access it as well. Um, we're not there yet. Um, so that's a, a coming up development. So I would keep an eye on it and see whether that's available in the coming uh months or years. Um, the second thing is, as I mentioned earlier, um, grants of administration are uh, another type of grant that people often get when there's no will. Um, grants of administration currently can't use a surrogate digital service. And as a result, they're still on paper. And in my experience, they're taking somewhere in the range of two, three, four months to, to get back. So they're working on chipping away at that list. I uh, The chief justice's of the surrogate division, um, or the ones that sort of head up the surrogate group at the, at the courthouse, uh, have clarified that they're working to try to decrease that wait time. But uh, that would be what you were looking at if you were getting a grant of administration, or you're getting a grant of probate through the written um, the written papers. So, um, so those are sort of the general lines surrounding getting a grant of probate. But I would say often clients are surprised to hear that it's one to two weeks, which I think is great. Um, clients are also happy because I think in other jurisdictions, it takes even longer than, you know, the three to four months that it would take to get a paper application reviewed. And I have nothing to add. To the famous unmute. <laughs> um, the one thing I might add to that would be um, what we're talking about is the court process. Like that's how long the court's taking, but obviously it's going to take, if you are the one applying for it, it's going to take you some time to do it. So as Ben had mentioned before, you don't have to use a lawyer, but if you do, um, you know, it can be faster, but there is some kind of gathering of documents that has to happen before that, that grant of, um, probate application can go in. So that can take some time as well. And I think that is variable depending on who's involved and what property is involved and whatnot too. So just to kind of caveat that a little bit as well. I should just add that the timelines that I was discussing were sort of post submission. So once it goes into the courthouse, but Jess makes a good point. Often a lot of the de delay or some of the time that's taken on an estate file is just us collecting information and putting it into the forms and working with the client. So you know, I think the more organized you are when you meet with your lawyer, the more you can decrease that amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but yes, there is some back and forth as we prepare documents that sort of doesn't factor into that as well. Okay, well, let's move on to the next question then. Huge question, very popular. Are there estate taxes or fees in Alberta? And I think I think Ben's taking starting this one off. Yes, and, and the answer is the classic lawyer answer, yes and no. So let me break it into categories for you. So the first category of uh, are there estates, uh, so estate taxes or fees is, do you pay tax on your stuff when you die? And the answer to that question is no. In the US, if you're really rich, you pay some tax on your stuff. In Canada, you do not. Second question is, but how come my relative had a big tax bill and he died? And the answer is because he had a lot of built up untaxed assets 
that have to finally be taxed when you die. So if I buy a lot of stock in IBM or in, in other companies way back in the 80s, and I bought the stock for 100 bucks and now it's 10,000, uh, there's tax on that gain of that investment, but you only pay it when you sell it. And the CRA doesn't let us carry that forever. When we die, we have to sell everything we own. And so there isn't a, a tax on our stuff just because we die, but it's forcing us to pay the taxes we would have paid if we sold it. So that's why some people feel like there's estate taxes, but there isn't. It would be no different than if you sold all your investments a week before you died and if you sold, than if you died. The third reason people believe there's an estate tax is there are fees to remove an estate through probate. And those fees are different in every jurisdiction and they're usually based on the value of the estate. So in provinces like BC and Ontario, those are the most common ones people in Alberta have relatives in, the fee is about 1.5% of the gross value of the estate. And so that can be pretty big for big estates. Alberta also has percentages, but we cap out at $525 of fees, and that's for a $300,000 estate. So the vast majority of estates hit that limit, and it never goes up from $525. So there is an attitude among people that it, A, takes a long time, and then B, like these, I, see, I should be saying one, two, huh? letters on my fingers, uh, two, uh, it's very, it takes long and it's expensive. So we want to avoid it if at all possible. And in Alberta, that's simply not the case. Some of the, the pretzel formations people put themselves into trying to dodge probate are more expensive than the problem they're trying to solve. Um, most lawyers, the fees are actually quite nominal. We're not that expensive to get you a grant of probate. And um, the tap, you don't have to pay an estate tax and you don't have to pay high probate fees. So the only way to know the taxes is to talk to an accountant. We won't get into that today. But just suffice it to say, there are no estate taxes in Canada. There are probate fees in some jurisdictions. And really, the only cost to dying is that you're forced to finally pay the taxes that you've been carrying, but never actually paying uh, throughout your life. Perfect. I think Maya's going to... She was writing with the fees earlier, so... <laughs> I, don't, I don't have anything to... That I think Ben uh, answered that question really well. So, oh, is that the next okay. question? No, okay. uh, we're still on this one. I, I thought it was a uh, impinging on the next question. No, no I think right. Ben did a great job on question five. I'm just okay. giving him kudos. Um, so, like Ben said, there is a there's a table of fees. So those are found in the surrogate rules of court. I don't I don't know if the table is there. I know it's within the court. Um, I'll try to find it and put it into the chat because I think okay. there is a table. Just so if you want to see the different, um, like there's the different brackets of income or different brackets of estate value has been mentioned. And then there's a different like fees associated. But as we, as Ben said, the hot, if your estate is worth 300,000 or more, you're only ever paying $525. So, so I've just put a link into the chat for anybody who's interested. Um, if you scroll down uh, on that page, there's a heading called surrogate matters and it has the table that I was referencing. Um, and also talks about some other um, filing fees and respective filing. So it outlines them as well. Yeah, perfect. And one other thing I'll clarify is we were talking about um, jurisdictions. And by that, I think we're only speaking provinces usually, right? Each province has its own fees mm -hmm. and own. Um, so just to clarify when, which jurisdictions we're talking about there. Okay, let's move on to question six then. What property does a grant of probate deal with, Maya? I think this is a great question and kudos to whomever asked it, because this is one of the first things that I deal with when I talk to clients about their wills planning. <clears throat> the reason why this is a great question is because it doesn't align with intuitively what we think we own. Um, and, and so when we talk about estate planning and what your estate, what is in your estate, what does your estate cover, what's in the residue, um, I think it can be a little confusing because you're thinking about a whole bunch of things. Um, and yet there are things that grants of probate don't address and that are falling outside of your estate. And so um, I'm going to first answer the question sort of more uh, strictly in terms of what does a grant of probate deal with? And then I'll just speak a little bit about some things that do not fall into an estate and how those are addressed in estates as well. So the first question is, what does a grant of probate deal with? Well, the most common version of this question I get is a client coming in and saying, do I need a grant of probate in this estate? 
And, and so if you're thinking that question, uh, the answer to that is, uh, what are the assets of the estate? And if you list those assets, we can usually help you to decide whether a grant of probate is needed. So um, some things that a grant of probate would be needed to deal with would include land um, that's solely in the name of the deceased. So what that would look like is you've pulled a land title certificate and the name of the person who owns it is solely the name of the deceased person. The other thing is if you pull a land title certificate and the person owns it as tenants in common, or there's no reference to joint tenancy on that title. <clears throat> so there is a manner in which co-ownership could also be dealt with by a grant of probate. It's called a tenancy in common. And that gets a little complex, but uh, you would wanna speak to your lawyer about that. I just wanna flag that um, uh, sole ownership or tenancy in common ownership would need a grant of probate to deal with. Why is that? Land titles is not going to move around. It's often the most valuable thing that people own um, unless they're sure they're moving it to the right person who has the legal authority to deal with it. And so land titles will always request a grant of probate if land is in the name of the deceased. Just as an asterisk on this, if you pull title and it says you know, Maya and so-and-so as joint tenants. So you're looking for the phrase joint tenants. And, and if you're looking for a land titles document, you can do that search yourself. It's available publicly. You can ask a lawyer to do it, um, or you can do it at land titles. Um, but essentially, if you see joint tenants on title, uh, joint tenancy properties do not need a grant of probate. Joint tenancy properties flow to the survivor um, who gets basically automatic ownership of the land once the deceased person dies. So all land titles will do is strike the name of the deceased joint tenant off title and the remaining owners will become the owners. So a grant of probate is not needed for joint tenancy properties. That's with respect to land. And so those are usually the three ways that people can own land solely in a tenancy in common or as joint tenants and both solely in tenancy in common would need a grant of probate to deal with. If we move to bank accounts, which are usually the next sort of big uh, bucket of things that people own, uh, similar to land, if you have a bank account that's in your name alone, you will need a grant of probate to deal with it. It's the same reason as land titles. Banks are not going to cash out all of your money unless they're certain, as Ben said at the beginning, that they're dealing with the right will. It's not a forgery and that they're correct in who they're going to give the money to. Now, uh, so I would say if you're looking at bank accounts, again, you want to find out who the owner of the accounts are. If it's solely owned by the deceased, that would need a grant of probate typically to deal with. I'll speak about some exceptions to that in a second. Similar to land, if you if you look at the ownership of a bank account or an investment account and it's owned by two people, um, it could flip to that joint owner and you would need to speak to the bank about, about whether it does or does not. Uh, it's not as simple as land. Um, and so there are some um, complications surrounding joint bank accounts. Um, sometimes they do go to the surviving joint owner easily. Sometimes they do not. And so the courts in Canada have been um, pretty thoughtful about trying to make some rules with respect to that. But I would say if you see one where it's jointly held, you would probably need to ask some additional questions of the bank and maybe a lawyer to figure out whether that does or does not need a grant of probate to deal with. Often the banks give you a really good sense and they'll sort of highlight or put a star next to the assets um, in those bank accounts that need a grant of probate. And so often you can turn this question over a little bit to the bank to let them tell you. So that's land and bank accounts. Um, you know, I haven't had any experience of registries needing grants of probate in my experience to deal with vehicles or serial numbered goods. In my view as a lawyer is, you know, I think you should get one anyways and bring it to do that transfer. Um, but in my experience, registries um, seem to be a little loosey goosier um, with respect to the requirements vis-a-vis -vis banks and land titles. I say the same thing to my clients. Registries are sloppy. Yeah. You get away with murder. Better to come with probate, but you don't need it. Yeah. So I, I mean, Ben and I are lawyers. I mean, I always tell people if you want a non-legal answer, ask a non-lawyer, but if you want Ben and I's opinion, grants of probate are valuable and you should bring it. It's what technically authorizes a transfer. Um, that being said, I have had estates where the only thing in it is a vehicle. And I have said, just go to land titles and do what you can. And, um, you know, if you can move it over to the correct person, if we don't have any concerns, you're, you can give that a shot. Um, uh, a couple other investment notes that I think are important are that 
Um, often people will hold a big chunk of their money in what's called an RSP or an RIF. So those are registered retirement savings plans or registered retirement income funds, or they'll hold it in a TFSA, a tax-free savings account. Commonly, those assets do not need a grant of probate to deal with because those assets often have a designated beneficiary or a successor holder on them. So if you have a RIF or an RSP, again, you'll want the bank to print it out and to find out whether that asset has a designated beneficiary on it. If it doesn't, it's going to fall into the estate and you would need a grant of probate to cash it out. But let's say I have an RSP and it has been named as the beneficiary on it. You would, if Ben would inherit it, um, he would need to, we would need to sort out the taxes on that, but he would inherit it, but he wouldn't need a grant of probate to make that transfer to him. He would typically do that with a death certificate. Designated beneficiaries are supposed to be a more efficient um, uh, way to move assets over to the ultimate owner without kind of going through the will and the grant of probate. <clears throat> that is a lot of information. I know I'm going to summarize it quickly. So what property does a grant of probate deal with? solely held real property, tenancy in common real property, solely held bank accounts, solely held investments, some joint bank accounts and joint investments. Um, it, it sort of depends. Those are sometimes tricky assets to figure out and usually you need the help of the bank or a lawyer. And, um, and any asset like a life insurance policy or a registered investment where there's no beneficiary on it. So if the bank comes back and says, you know what, there's no beneficiary or the beneficiary is listed as the estate, they will then require a grant of probate to cash that out. What if some property that you don't need a grant of probate to deal with that you can get away without getting a grant? Joint tenancy real property. So property where you see that joint tenancy phrase on title, you can usually do that without a grant of probate. Uh, true, true with right of survivorship joint accounts. So sometimes banks will say, nope, this is an account that can go over to the surviving owner. That would not need a grant of probate. And any asset where you have a properly designated beneficiary. So that would include life insurance, RIFs, RSPs, LIFs, um, or successor holders. Those are sort of how they sometimes call TFSA. <clears throat> uh, so those are kind of the two areas. Um, but if you have any of those things in the first category, it will typically trigger the requirement for a grant of probate. And the, the only thing I want to add there, because that as Maya correctly introduced that topic, this is where all the action is usually as lawyers. We're we're navigating this question, what's in and what's out of the estate. Uh, so the only thing I want to add is some people come in with very modest estates mm -hmm. where um, the person didn't have a lot of money and they were on a fixed income. Or alternatively, a lot of their assets were joint with a spouse or with the, a child, and there was just one checking account with $15,000 in it. In rare cases, banks will release money without a grant of probate, but they're under no obligation to. It's just from a client service perspective, they are able to release funds and they just take a chance that they got it right, that they're giving it to the right person. And uh, they just ask the, that the family all sign off and sign some paperwork saying that we're, we're not going to sue the bank if this is technically not correct. So for very small estates, you can sometimes get money out of bank. Uh, but if you got over $30,000, there's just no chance. And if you've got any land in the deceased's name alone, there's no chance you have to get probate. Thanks, Ben. I forgot. I meant to go back to that. So I'm, well, I'm happy. You had to 10 have... minutes of things you had to say. So <laughs> I'm happy to have it. somebody watching. That was a, a point I wanted to make. I'm happy to. That's. And if I can take just a second here then to connect this question to the last one. So the last question we talked about fees based on the value of your estate. And when, so when we talk about what you need a grant of probate to deal with, that's the estate we're talking about. So if most of your property is held um, in say investments with designated beneficiaries, then the court's not looking at that portion to base those fees off of. So if you have half a million dollars sitting over there, but you only have a hundred thousand dollars sitting elsewhere that you need a grant of probate to deal with, then that fee is based on that hundred thousand dollars, not that other, those investments with, with, ben, um, designated beneficiaries. So that's where that whole piece of estate planning comes in and where, you know, Ben and Maya spend a lot of time with their clients as well, then is, is figuring that out. Although like we just talked about estate fees in Alberta are not super high to begin with. Um, but that's just to kind of connect the math on that, I'd say. And this is that pretzel reference I made earlier. Some people go to great lengths to get everything naming beneficiaries and 
being in joint names to avoid the uh, awful $525 Alberta fee because they have a relative in Ontario who had to pay a 20 grand fee. So you, you can just plan your way around it, but just don't overdo it. Because some people accidentally cause more problems no. than they solve trying to avoid probate fees. Yeah, I agree with Ben. I think a very common question that kind of goes with this question is, when should I put my kids on my property? When should I put my kids on my joint bank accounts? And what I tell people, I don't know if Ben agrees with this, but in Alberta, the incentive to do that is much lower. And I have seen so many logistical issues with that, that I don't recommend it. So I think there's something going on on Facebook, or maybe it's people talking to people in other provinces where there's this real thing that like, my friends are saying, I've got to add my son to title. So in Alberta, you don't have to add a child to title um, for, for any, you know, I always ask people, well, why do you want to do it? Because there are sometimes legitimate reasons to do it. But here are some of the downsides. When you add a child to title, they become an owner of the property exactly the same as you. So they have all the rights that you have with it. That means that you need their consent to sell it, their consent to mortgage it, and they're not going to transfer it back to you if you change your mind. I've have had now two files where the parents have decided later on, actually, you know, we didn't really understand what we were doing there. We want the property back. And the child has said no. And so, you know, I think as an estate lawyer, I'm very cautious about adding people to, to title for estate planning purposes. That's Alberta exclusive, you know, um, advice. I think the advice in other provinces is dissimilar because they have um, provincial um, taxes and other reasons why you would you would want things to be co-owned. But I think co-ownership comes with a lot of issues. I know in my, you know, extended family, there's a lot of people who are adding people to bank accounts. I have had, and Ben probably has too, many files where joint bank accounts have gone sideways, where, you know, people are adding it for convenience or efficiency or to avoid probate. And, you know, their child has gone and spent a whole bunch of it without any kind of transparency about where that money's gone or other siblings are asking where, where the funds in that account went or somebody dies in the bank locks the account because they're just not sure who the owner is. So I always, I always try to say, don't let the tail wag the dog, which I think is something Ben is also saying, which is don't let avoiding probate change the way you're structuring ownership of your assets. I just don't think in Alberta, given, you know, our tax situation and, and the, the application situation that it's worth it. And I've just, I would just caution people on accepting that advice, um, which I hear all the time um, to, to move everything into joint names of children. I just don't know if in Alberta, it's a good idea. I've seen a lot of uh, downsides to that. Again, it's 500 bucks in two weeks. Yeah. Not the boogeyman. And you could trigger all kinds of, now Ben and I aren't accountants, at least I'm not an accountant. Yeah, but we, we have uh, a lot of friends who are. I, you know, there are tax issues with that too. I know that if, if I add a child to property, they may already have a property and now they've got two and there may trigger capital gains on that disposition. So I always tell clients who are thinking about this before you ever do it, you really want to talk to an accountant about what the tax implications of that decision might be. So, yeah. And, and that's a, a talk unto itself. So we'll just leave it to say that when you sell your house that you live in, you don't pay any tax for the gain, right? You bought it for a hundred. Now it's four. You made $300,000 over 30 years. You don't pay any tax on that because it's your house. But if it's a rental property or a vacation property, you don't get to have that exemption. You do pay the gain. And when you yeah. add kids to title, what you're doing is you're diluting that exemption because they have their own house they live in. They don't live with you. Now, rare case where the child does live with mom, uh, that's where people come to me saying, should I do this? And I'll say, yeah, actually, you know what? Yeah. That makes sense. They live there too. They're the only beneficiary of the estate. There's no harm in adding them. Yeah. Like the, the rule should be don't do it unless the lawyer says, yeah, it's a good idea. That's right. Not the other way around, which is what most people think these days. And since we're talking about this, I think we can answer Darlene's question here. She asked, does a beneficiary have to pay capital gains on a house after they go through probate and decide to sell the property within a year? And I think, I think what you're, so I, I echo Ben's sentiment and again, neither of us are going to give you tax advice. So that the answer probably is go speak to an accountant, but I will say there is an exemption for the deceased. If it was their primary residence and you can use that exemption on one residence, I think you can elect which one you want it to go on. But in any event, it may be that the deceased gets an exemption from capital gains, um, whether the beneficiary has to pay taxes is more of a question of that beneficiary's own tax situation. So, so that's a little harder to ascertain. Um, but once it's moved into the beneficiary's name, um, then you don't have to worry about that. The and beneficiary. Darlene's being well-informed or knows more than she's letting on because there is a one free year in the yeah. formula. 
So yes, if okay. you sell it within one year, there's no capital gain tax. Okay, yep. So that's good. There you go. I will also plug here that we did a webinar on owning joint <laughs> property. So that is up on Seaplease YouTube channel and it is featuring Ben as well. So if you, Natalie can post the, the link for that in the chat and you're welcome to go take a look at that. And we talk a little bit more about the whole issue of, of adding kids um, to property as well, but just um, joint ownership in general. So if you want more on that, check out our YouTube channel. That's great. I'm just going to add one little nuance and it leads right into the next question. But when I'm looking at this question, it's asking what property is a grant of probate deal with? And part of that answer that I haven't given yet is a grant of probate from the courts of Alberta deals with property within Alberta. So it does not deal with property outside of the borders of Alberta. That's a so, great segue. We should have yeah, that. what about property outside of Alberta? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this question is, is thankfully a much shorter question. So as Maya had just indicated, when you get a grant in Alberta, it deals with Alberta property. Now, the good news is virtually all property follows you around. So as you move, uh, where you are resident is where someone applies for probate and where your estate lives. And with very few exceptions, your money follows you, regardless of who the bank is. Um, there are some exceptions when we start to go international. Uh, the big issue is land. Land lives where it is. So if I've got uh, a vacation property in BC and I die in Alberta, I do need to get a grant in Alberta, and then I go get another one in BC just for that property. Even if I own uh, a third of the family farm with my siblings in Saskatchewan, same thing. My estate has to go get a grant after Alberta. It goes over to Saskatchewan, gets another one just for one third interest in that property. And that's why you want to take advantage of what Maya was talking about before, which is if you might consider making a joint owner of that property in another jurisdiction so you don't have to bother with that extra work. Because probate's not a big deal, but having to do it three times can be a big deal. So if you've got property that is land or uh, sometimes corporations outside of Alberta, it's good to try to spring load that mechanism so that if you die, you don't need probate. It automatically moves to the beneficiary you want. And that's something you do not want to do at home. You definitely want professional advice when doing it. Yeah, I completely agree. One thing I'll just add, because it happened in our family, is uh it's common for Albertans to have a second property in um, Phoenix. That's sort of a, and Arizona seems to be a little Alberta down in the States. Um, and so I would go to the jurisdiction where you have the property that Ben has mentioned and see a lawyer there um, who can talk to you about options. One thing I learned about Arizona is that you can have successive ownership on title. So you can file a document that just automatically creates almost like a designated beneficiary, but on a property. We don't have that in Alberta. That's why we've been talking about co-ownership and joint ownership, because we're trying to sort of think about that. And I think if, if they got around to this Arizona concept, we would have a lot less joint ownership issues. But I always recommend if somebody has a property outside of Alberta, as Ben said, spring load it, try to figure out if you can get away with um, making it as easy as possible for your beneficiaries. And sometimes the jurisdiction will have some really beneficial laws that you can take advantage of. Yeah, and, three, and fun fact, in, in a lot of Central America, they actually require that you spring load succession on land because they have so many foreign owners of vacation properties that uh, they, they wouldn't be able to survive if they had 10 years of, of land not being distributed to beneficiaries. So they actually mandate that you have a mechanism in place when you buy it to go to someone else because uh, that is a really, it is a real issue and it causes a lot of complications. We better move on because I was going to say, new idea for Alberta law. We'll just put that in the, <laughs> in the idea bin there. Um, we are on question eight. So this is our last formal question, and then we'll get to the Q&A. So what can delay a grant to probate? And we could probably talk about this all day. Um, but <laughs> I'll, Maya? I'll give the short list, and Ben can supplement with other thoughts that he has. Um, so um, uh, right now, in terms of grant of probate, Ben and I are both sort of thinking about the SDS system. That's the most common uh, system. So I guess one way you can delay it is not using a lawyer right now, because lawyers are the only ones able to access the SDS system. So if you don't use a lawyer or a law firm, um, you'll be doing it by paper, which will slow down the process slightly. That's not a big deal. It's just that if you use a law firm right now under the current framework, it will increase it to one to two weeks. So it's, it is, sorry, it will decrease the 
processing time to one to two weeks rather than, you know, the three to four months. So that is a delay that will change and evolve over time. The government's objective actually is to roll out that system to the public. And so um, that's just sort of a time limited answer, but currently not using a lawyer would delay getting a grant of probate just because we can access a system that goes a lot faster. Um, even within that system, though, even if we're in the SDS super quick system, if you have minors in an estate, um, often that will trigger the involvement of the Office of the Public Guardian and Trustee. Their office is independent of the courthouse, and so um, uh, applications need to be vetted by another third party before a grant is issued. And so the courts then become subject to the timelines of the Office of the Public Guardian and Trustee. Um, I think they're doing a, a, an admirable job of trying to get through their applications based on what, the, what staffing they have, but I think some delays that can be existing there. Um, those are sort of things you can't help though. If you have minors, it's just something you have to go through. So that delay a grant. Um, right now in Alberta, if somebody lacks a will, um, you can't access the SDS system that Ben and I have spoken about. So you would need a grant of administration that can't be done through the SDS system and is done through paper forms. And in my experience, because we lawyers also have to use paper forms for that, that can cause a, a bit of a delay. It would take in the months rather than in the weeks um, to get that. Um, and I also have a note here that if your executor is residing outside of Alberta, that can cause a delay for a couple of reasons. Obviously, there's a logistical issue of having somebody outside the province, but they also may need to post a bond, um, which can cause some additional um you know, forms and things that need to be done. And also, if you have an executor outside, you can't access the SDS system as well. And so that would also mean that you're in the paper system and, and doing it that way. And then lastly, just a, a catch all that if your estate is complicated, and, and I would say SDS does a really good job of navigating even complex estates. Um, but sometimes there's complexities in terms of business interests, in terms of um, beneficiaries who've put what we call an estate caveat on the file, which um, which could mean that litigation is coming up or a lawsuit might be started. Um, those things can delay uh, a grant of probate. Now, the courts can still issue a grant of probate, even if somebody's contesting the will. Um, um, it just can complicate things, I suppose, and delay and, and mean that uh, the grant of probate isn't issued as quickly or that there are sort of issues with the usage of the grant of probate. And so that would be my answer on that. The only things I could think to add um, is that sort of outside the probate process itself is the time it takes before you file. Uh, that's often the single biggest contributor to, uh, as one person has asked, uh, you know, is one and a half years a long time for probate? Yes, but also not unheard of. Uh, and that usually stems from it taking a long time to file. And as Maya was alluding to, sometimes it's very complicated assets. And so we're just not ready to file because we don't know all the information yet. And sometimes we're unable to answer that question without talking to lots of professionals and digging up records and that kind of thing. Uh, so usually when I, I get clients, I really encourage them, like when everyone's paying attention, when, when you're in town for the funeral, we really hustle to yeah. talk to the banks and, and talk to the life insurance because everyone's paying attention in those few weeks. And we do everything we can to get probate filed within those first three weeks. The second thing is, and this is especially true for the DIY people, one of the value of using a lawyer is, is that it's easy to make mistakes on the form because mm -hmm. you don't really know exactly what's being asked for. And what happens in the internal process is you file your materials, it goes to a surrogate clerk, and they review it for just su uh, surface level compliance. And if there's any mistakes, they give it back to you. And you get it back pretty quick in a couple of weeks. But if you pass that first hurdle, it goes in a ginormous pile of files to be reviewed. Uh, and then eventually it makes its way to a judge and the judge reviews it and they may find one thing that they just wanted more clarity on or a bit more information on. So they reject it, goes back to the clerks, the clerks return it to you and you get the note about what they want you to fix. And so you fix it and you send it back in and then it waits for a long time and it makes its way to a judge and the judge reviews it and oh, they found something else they missed on the first pass. And then it goes back to you and around and around it goes. So that's a way that it can really get delayed, not for any major issue, but just small clarity issues. And a lawyer is more likely to catch those problems and submit clean paperwork. Uh, so that does come up. And the last one, as Maya alluded to, is disputes. If someone is disputing something in the estate, uh, they can block the progress of the probate by filing what's called a caveat. Very easy to do. Uh, and it just shuts everything due to settled. But good lawyers like Maya 
and uh, the people we work with all the time, will usually put an agreement in place between the parties that says, let's get the grant of probate, let's sell the condo, let's liquidate the, the, the investments, because that has nothing to do with our dispute. Our dispute is over who gets the money or how much each of us get. So let's keep the administration going, but when we're done, we can fight about who gets what. So we don't want to gum up the works. And that's another advantage to having good uh, representation. That's all I'll say on delay. I think here too, maybe I can knock off one of the questions here. Somebody was asking, what type of information should you be gathering to prepare for the surrogate digital system or for probate? And that's a great question. Um, often if you work with a lawyer, the lawyer will send a questionnaire out and that sort of prompts you for the types of information you need. Um, but if you're a DIYer and you want to do it without the assistance of a lawyer, um, basically I would start by printing off all the forms and the forms will prompt you for what types of information you need to be gathering. Ultimately, it's beneficiary contact information, information about the deceased and information about what the estate has within it. So we call it an inventory, but what the estate has. And as Ben said, often you can get that in the first few weeks if you can, that's ideal. And, and you would be going to banks to get um, some of that information um, or land titles or corporate valuations or, or those types of things. So those are the types of things to be gathering. Excellent. Well, thank you both. As I said, that brings us us to the end of our formal questions, but there are several questions in the chat in the Q and A box. So we'll turn it over to those, and I'll read some of the out, and then Ben or Maya, whichever of you mm -hmm. wants to to jump in, you can. Um, so there's a question here about a catch twenty two. If, if the purpose of a probate is to make sure the will is the final one, how can the process of an executor named on a will to apply for a probate when this may not be the final one? That's a question. It's a lot easier than you think it is. Um, the Generally, everyone knows what the last will and testament mm -hmm. is. It's no secret. Um, and so the, the family knows what the will is. They give it to the court and the court says, it's Ben. He's the executor. And then everyone who's involved in the family gets notice. And someone might say, well, hold up. There was a new will made where it's not Ben because she and Ben had a falling out and, and she didn't want him anywhere near the estate. And then they bring the newer will forward and that person applies. But most of the time, it's it's not a uh, there's no uncertainty there. Um, so, so I, I it's a it, it's a good point about catch twenty two, but it's not really a, any problem. Okay, next question: Does the court keep a copy of the will it has granted probate for that the beneficiaries could obtain if they are perhaps doubting that the executor is using the correct final will? I can answer that one. Yes, the court keeps not only a copy of the will, the court actually keeps the original will. So um, it gets vaulted on the court side. We don't keep the original will as lawyers. So the original will is there. But to answer the other question is, you can search as a member of the public, the court records. Um, uh, so it's easier again with the assistance of a lawyer, but you can do it yourself if you go to the courthouse. There are forms uh, and you can request uh, surrogate documents. I think you need to include the name of the deceased. And what you're looking for is what's called an application for a grant of probate. That's usually the most useful document. It provides a copy of the will, and it also provides um, underlying information about who the executor is, who the beneficiaries are, and what's in the estate. And sometimes when clients sort of just want to get a handle on what's going on in the estate, that's a good place to start. And I would add that we, we would hope that the people who want to see it all do, because they will be the people who are legally entitled to be served. But yeah. for those people who are not legally entitled, they and they're interested, they can search it as Maya said. It's a public record. Okay, next question. If you own farm property, is there a capital gain of the owner uh, of the ownership if it's tenants in common? I'm not touching a tax question. I'll, so I'll, I'll touch it with with uh, big uh, mitts on. Um, <laughs> so you, you have whenever you're dealing with farm property, you need professional advice. One of the mm -hmm. great ironies of any legal and tax issue is the simpler uh, and small scale the problem, the more professional advice you need because it's more complicated. Farms especially. Uh, there are tons of farm specific tax issues um, that are only applicable to farms and are their whole area of specialty. So tenants in common is a bit of a misnomer, whether it's joint or sole or uh, multiple, multiple people owning in common. Uh, those are not very significant from a tax perspective. That is not the key issue. The key issue is, 
uh, what its adjusted cost base was when you acquired it, what the value was when you sold it, whether you use your lifetime capital gains exemption, whether it's been in the family and been used continuously for farming since the introduction of the capital gains tax. Like, I'm not a tax lawyer, but I know well enough why no, I should never touch that issue. <laughs> so definitely get professional advice involving farms. Perfect. Okay, next question. Is my understanding correct that the old style manual probate application does not require a lawyer, but the new online application process must be done by a lawyer and the fee they presumably charge to do this? Uh, so the answer is there is always an availability to access the system with no lawyer. That's That was the case under the old system. It's the case under the new system. If you want not to use a lawyer under the new system, you're using paper forms. So the forms have been updated. They are supposed to be more user-friendly um, forms. So they're supposed to be forms that sort of have some answers to your questions in them. Um, but you can certainly do that. Um, what Ben and I have been speaking about is a new system that just rolled out uh, sort of at the end of last year called SDS. That's currently reserved for lawyers and law firms um, because we're sort of working out the kinks in that system. Um, so you can always apply for grant appropriate without a lawyer. If you want to access this SDS service right now, you do need to use a lawyer. Um, but I think the goal of the government would be to release that to the public at some point. And so um, and so I think you'll be able to access SDS uh, without a lawyer eventually as well. Excellent. Okay, we're checking along because we have like four minutes left and there's Five questions still. So does it make a difference if my investment advisor is in Ontario versus Alberta? No, generally the money lives where you live. Perfect. Okay. If, <laughs> we'll cut it off there. <laughs> if a grant of probate is given by courts, can the will still be contested? I think we've talked a little bit about this already. Ben's nodding that's his a head. That's lunch on its own, right, Maya? Yes, definitely. The short answer is yes. Uh, uh, like when, when you get a grant, that is the court's opinion on what should be done. But that, that does not preclude someone from coming out and saying, hold on, you didn't have this key piece of information that was essential. And uh, you can open up probate after it's been granted. But the longer, the more time that elapses after that date, the harder and harder it becomes. And eventually a court will refuse to open up a grant, especially if the estate's been distributed already. Hey, okay. how do you go about paying estate bills while waiting for probate? Oh, that's a good question. Um, frequently, so there's a couple options. I always tell clients, if you take the bills and they're in the name of the deceased, so the deceased owes them, like a funeral, uh, depends on how that's issued. But anyway, typically, in my view, banks will often allow the payment of, of debts of the deceased. So a visa bill of mine, a TELUS bill of mine, or even funeral expenses will often cut checks directly out of the estate, estate account. So I usually tell clients to consolidate those and bring them into the bank and see how many they can get the bank to pay out of the deceased funds. That way, my client, the executor, isn't out of pocket. Um, if they can't do that and they want to get the bill paid, I mean, another option is just to leave the bill for a while and tell people I'm working on it. I will pay it as soon as I have access to funds. Some executor clients I have say, well, you know, I'll just pay it off. I just want to don't want interest to accrue. So I'll pay it off. And if they do that personally, there is a process later whereby they can get reimbursed for any out of pocket payments they've made on behalf of the estate. And the only thing I'll add to that is that uh, while you should never assume interest will be waived. I would say very commonly in this industry, um, interest is waived. You'd be amazed at how decent even credit card companies are around someone's death. They very often waive all the interest. So uh, you don't have to pay out of pocket if you don't have the money to do it. Okay, and I think we'll end with this last question here. I know there's a few others and and uh, if we, we might be able to get to them, but I'm, I might end with this one. Um, regarding life leases, life lease payments being delayed to the estate, will that hold up probate? And that's a, a fantastic question um, because it's, I'm seeing it. I don't know about you, Maya. Are you seeing this a lot lately? I haven't been, no. I've, 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 had, a, I've, I've had about four in the last two years. Hmm. So just for the, those of you who don't know what a life lease is, this is the arrangement that a lot of seniors' homes hmm. use where it's not a condo, it's not an apartment that you rent, it's a life lease. And what you're doing is you're, pay, you're paying money to the, the facility up front. And when they're done, they give it back the money back to you um, with a percentage taken off for every year you lived there. Mm -hmm. And the catch on those contracts, and this is something you should be aware of when you're buying in, um, the catch is that they don't pay you immediately when you pass away or when you vacate. 
uh, backfill it with someone else, and then you get your all your money back less the, the, the percentage per year. So what's happened in recent years, it started in COVID, is you have a lot of these big retirement uh, buildings, and um, a lot of people were anxious about moving into these spaces during COVID because of how um, many other elderly people are there and how high the risk is. Just You want to stay at home. Uh, and that backlog hasn't cleaned out yet. So a lot of my clients with life leases have been seeing six, nine, 12 month delays in getting their money back um, mm. from the, these contracts. Uh, this is not them behaving badly. It's not a sign that they're about to go bankrupt. Well, at least I hope so. But uh, I can tell you, I've seen them send these letters out uh, advising that there will be a delay in receiving the money. Uh, and for those where I have reviewed the contract, it absolutely permits them to do this. Uh, and all of them so far did get paid eventually. And I don't think that would necessarily delay probate. I think you could probably get a pretty good estimate of what the payout may be um, and, and use that. So you don't have to have everything finalized. If you can get a good sense of what the ultimate payout would be, I would just include that for the purposes of filing. Perfect. I know there's a few questions we didn't get to, um, but I, I do have to cut it off here because we are at time. So I want to thank uh, Ben and Maya so much for joining us today uh, to go through all those great questions, and provide a lot of great information. Uh, just a reminder, some of you who did have questions, some of those answers might be on cplea.ca. Um, that you'll see a box that says wills and estates. That's where you'll find some information uh, on grants of probate to end some of those pieces. So make sure to check that out. And then um, Natalie had posted these in the chat. We do have a booklet called Getting a Grant of Probate or Administration in Alberta. It's been updated based on the new forms. So you can check that out as well. Again, that's on our website. And really quickly, I'll say we have one more webinar left in this series, and that's Privacy Issues at Work. And that's on June 27th. So you can register through Eventbrite for that one as well. Um, and so hopefully we'll see you there. Other than that, I'm going to say thank you all for joining us. And thank you, Ben and Maya as well. And have a great rest of your Wednesday afternoon. Thanks, Jess. Pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for having me.